So my name is Melody Wilson. I am a graduating senior sales and marketing major here at Tuskegee University. Okay. And I am a native of Birmingham, Alabama by way of Fairfield. And I am a 2015 graduate of Ramsey High International Baccalaureate School. Oh, that's the, I haven't, I just heard Ramsey yes. High. Yes. You know, I was a member, I was a, a part of the first cohort for the International Baccalaureate Program okay. at Ramsey. Okay, so explain what that is. So the International Baccalaureate Program is much like um, the AP Advanced Placement. However, it is kind of like um, deemed about focusing on like the international aspect of, of everything. So like U.S. history, so math, whereas with AP, you know, it focuses on like United States. Mm. And the history class, for example, your history class would be international. Right. So we talked about a lot of the, his the historical stuff that has happened to Americans. But then we also got to learn it from the different perspectives of, you know, like Brazil or United Nations, you know, things of that sort. Okay. So, all right. Everybody in Birmingham knows Ramsey is like the upper echelon the of high school. So how did how does your parents or <laughs> your family structure play in a part of your growth and education and getting to Ramsey? Well, I grew up in a household. It was three of us. I have an older sister mm -hmm. and an older brother. Okay. All of us were educated in the city of Fairfield, with the exception of my sister. She uh, pursued her education in another school system, a private school. Okay. And in eighth grade, it's so interesting because I used to, I don't know, I just went through like a rebel stage in seventh grade. So my mom took me out of Forest Hills and made me go to another school in Birmingham, which is how I got introduced to Birmingham City Schools, W.J. Christian. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in a household where my mom was, you know, a boss. My father as well. He attended Alabama State University where he was in the band. And, you know, he didn't finish. But my mom, on the other hand, she pursued a bachelor's of nursing and graduated from the University of North Alabama. So my mom and my dad played a very pivotal role in our education or how we saw education. But because my mom was, like, so heavily involved in the nursing field, and she pursued a lot of like management levels. Like I saw firsthand how important education was. Okay, and they they were a big part in your everyday. Right, in my, in my more everyday. More so than your teachers. Um, I will say it's a hand in hand. So mm -hmm. like, there's a huge age gap between all of, of my siblings. My oldest brother, who is my dad's from a previous relationship, mm -hmm. my sister and I are seven years apart, and my brother six. So yeah, mm -hmm. we grew up in the same household, but I got to see firsthand from my siblings how important education was. Mm -hmm. My mom, by the time I came around, like I always say, my old folks don't need kids. So my parents were older when they had me. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got to learn from the mistakes and the successes of my siblings, and that's how. I feel like I've become super involved in how in seeing how important education is. Okay. When did you start planning for your school and then coming to pick Tuskegee and your major? <laughs> so I've known, I've always known about college. Mm -hmm. I knew, I didn't start planning until, honestly, I would say junior, somewhat senior year of, mm -hmm. of high school. I knew college was important. I just knew because my entire paternal side of my family went to Alabama State. My siblings went to Alabama State with the exception of my oldest brother. He graduated from here. Mm -hmm. um, my cousins, everybody went to Alabama State. I just knew I didn't want to go there. And it's nothing against the school. It was just I wanted, I've always been different. So mm -hmm. I've never wanted to follow in tradition. It's never been my thing. Mm -hmm. So... Senior year of high school, I got a, 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 into a lot of schools. I got into NYU, but NYU was too expensive, so I knew I couldn't go there. Mm -hmm. I got into Dillard. Xavier was in Louisiana was my dream school because I wanted to be a physician because my mom is so prevalent in my life. She's a nurse. So I'm like, I've always wanted to be in the medical field, mm -hmm. but with respects to being a doctor because I didn't like, you know, want anybody to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And... um. So Xavier, that was my dream school. Mm -hmm. But then my dad was like, you're not going that far away. He used to make a joke about like, you know, driving over all of that water and you know, something happened and I wouldn't be able to get home. Mm -hmm. So I knew I didn't want to go there. So I would say I applied to Tuskegee, I got accepted on the spot, and then I got a scholarship on the spot at a career expo in Birmingham, Alabama for all types of colleges. And I knew how important HBCUs were in the lives of African Americans, but mm -hmm. it never was like, 
you know, a factor in my education, like, period. So I thought I wanted to be a nurse. You know, Tuskegee is known in the state of Alabama for producing, like, a lot of African-American nurses. And one of my good friends from high school, her mom was, like, is, like, a nurse practitioner for Children's Hospital, and she attended Tuskegee. So I'm like, okay, I know I have to go to Tuskegee. But when I got here and I filled my first biology test, I was like, mm, science is really not for me. So then I started thinking about everything that I like to do. I grew up in a family of musicians, so I used to, I sing, but I ain't trying to make no career out of it or nothing. But then I was always doing the church announcements, I was always ushering, I was always that child in church that people may read or act. So I'm like, okay, so what career is related to that? So then I got thrown into media because I met one of my great mentors until this day. She was a radio personality for 95.7 Jams, and you know, 95.7 Jams is like, Huge in Birmingham. 95, 7, right, it's like huge here. Like so, mentor? my mentor is Deanna Reed. She was my very first mentor, okay. and so I talked to her senior year because at the time I started a choir in Birmingham with a former friend of mine, two of my former friends, and so I kind of acquired the business manager role. Okay. So that kind of activated in me that media was something that I wanted to pursue. And then when I kind of put it into practice and asked her about all of the different careers and things of the sort that she did, you know, she was kind of the reason why media was something that I wanted to pursue for a career because, you know, she's like the bomb.com. Mm. But in essence, I knew biology wasn't the, the thing for me either because I feel like a lot of the times when we have pivotal role models in our lives, we kind of somewhat live their passion for our lives and not our own. Mm. So coming to Tuskegee, I think, allowed me to come into my own. And, you know, the communications program was very much so new at the time, but I knew that wasn't the program for me. So I felt like I would have been more marketable um, taking on the discipline of sales and marketing. So what are some of the struggles you think young black African-American women go through in college, whether it be the transition or during that four year stretch? Hmm. I would think as a woman period, especially in this day and age, women constantly have to prove themselves for absolutely everything. Um, I won't say on this campus alone that I've had to experience like gender discrimination, but I will say like kind of like in the workforce, mm. um, I've had about a couple of internships. So I've gotten to see people's view and paradigms of women, especially an African-American woman. You could be the smartest woman in the room. You could say two plus two is four, and people know that, but they're just definitely going to challenge you. But I will say being the daughter of a very strong black woman who's had to encourage a lot of hurdles on her own, I was totally equipped for this type of things that I've had to deal with. I'm not a punk, so, you know, I'm very outspoken, which I'm great. I'm really glad that I've always been outspoken, but Tuskegee definitely cultivated that bold spirit that I already came here with and knowing that it's fine to, you know, be a woman that people might necessarily, you know, depict as being this very loud African-American woman. But I'm fine with being the super aggressive African-American woman because I am convicted in what I believe and I don't have a problem with anybody who has a problem with it. What do you think some of the specific struggles are like uh, during college? Like during college, financially, relationship wise, mm -hmm. personal. Struggles? I would say relationship wise, most definitely. That's something that I could relate to the most. Mm -hmm. I've experienced a long distance relationship for like half of my collegiate career. And being the woman that I am who has so many visions and goals and dreams for myself it's sometimes not seen or acceptable. However, if the shoe was on the other foot, you know, it's expected of you to support your partner no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's expected of you to hold them down, to help them with their homework, to listen to their struggles, their woes, their failures. But then when the shoe is on the other foot, you know, it's kind of a, a blind eye turn to it. I will say that I rely on my faith a lot. So anything that I struggle with, whether it be academics or, you know, gender discrimination among certain people, I don't really get offended by that because I know who I am as a person. So I don't really say that I've experienced that, so to speak, but in terms of like the specific struggles with, you know, balancing relationships and, you know, being superwoman, having to manage your many different responsibilities while maintaining your relationship and making sure that your partner's happy, that's been a huge struggle. Or do you think um, young girls in college put too much emphasis on relationships and not focusing on where well, you see the pitfalls of them right. striving for that? Absolutely. So 
even the strongest of the strongest women sometimes allow the opinions of the opposite sex, especially in a relationship, to kind of hinder you. I mm. think with women, we mature far much more faster than the men. That's just, you know, historical. So a lot of the times we put those type of expectations on the person that we are dating. And one thing that I struggle with as I've gotten older is feeling like, you know, sometimes every person you date is not the person that you're supposed, you're supposed to be with. Like everything is seasonal. So I think it's important for African-American women and women specifically to remember that you are young, your priorities come first, your dreams and your goals come first, and that should never, ever be sacrificed um, and be conditional off the strength and love of a man. Because at the end of the day, what one won't do, another one will. And that's just God's way of just saying that you need to get your focus in order. Um, a shooting happened in Hoover at the Galleria Young, two black guys were killed. One. I thought it was two. <laughs> two? Where the other one come from? 18-year-old. No, he was injured, but oh, he's, he's, still he's fine okay. now. All right, so 18-year-old injured. The 12-year-old was injured, too. 12-year-old injured, and EJ was killed. He was the only one killed by the police. Right. So what do you think about the situation? Of course, you've been there before. Right. So I think the situation is most definitely so devastating and so unfortunate. I think a lot of the times when you see these things happening around the world, you never think about how it could hit home. And I saw a quote yesterday um, from Mamie Till, who was the mother of the late Emmett Till, and we all know how he was killed. And I'm definitely paraphrasing it because I can't remember it specifically, but I remember one thing she said in there was, she lived in Chicago, she had a son, and she lived in a great apartment. So she was seeing all of the things that were happening to Negroes in the South but she thought to herself, since her conditions were great, she didn't think enough to empathize with the people and what they were going through until it happened to her son. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the times we need to be more conscious, not just when it's conditional. And just alone, what I've seen and the opinions of people, I think it's just so disappointing, not just as a race, but as humans, period. We've got to learn how to stop being so selfish because it could have been any of us. I have two brothers. I have a nephew, I have a lot of people that I'm friends with that are males that are African Americans and it could have happened to any of us. So I think we need to make it our business as people, especially African Americans, to be more supportive regardless of who it is. And I saw a lot of things online that were like, African Americans do a lot of things to each other, so why should we respect people as human? Being a child of God is not conditional. It's our duties, regardless of who you believe in, it's our duties as, as children, period, to be concerned and, and to always love one another. I hate that that happened, but it, we needed something, we needed something, especially the city of Birmingham, mm -hmm. we needed something to happen for us to realize how powerful we are as a group of people and as a race. Mm -hmm. Um... You know, I'm not saying that there's anything that we can do as of right now to fix the the disparities within the African Americans, you know, world and society. A lot of these issues are generational. Mm -hmm. A lot of these issues has everything to do with the rearing and the responsibility as parents, great grandparents, da -da -da -da, whatever, whatever, whatever. So I think going forward, I'm going to continue to pray and support those people who are supporting EJ because what happened was totally wrong there's always a way to do certain things so i just really hope that justice is served and that there are good things that come from this mm. i want to especially shout out carlos i can't think of his last name but he's like a young african-american in the city of birmingham who is an activist mm. and he is totally convicted in what he believes i wish that i was president in birmingham right now to see the aftermath of everything but i wish that it, that there were more people out there who are that selfless to fight for something that they know is wrong. Because it's one thing to agree with something being wrong in private, but it's another thing for you to agree about it and be loud about it in public. Mm. A lot of people that's not from Birmingham don't realize this happens almost every other day. Like every day. The, at the Western Hills Mall. Every day. It happens all the time. Nothing. Nobody. Don't even make, does it even make the news? No. So, it might make it to social media, but that's about it. And they also don't understand why it's such a bigger deal because it happened in Hoover. Because Hoover is the upscale, 
uh, Porsche. It's not really in Birmingham. It's definitely it? not Birmingham. And <laughs> but people consider it part of Birmingham. I don't even want that type of association to Birmingham. Hoover is its own separate entity and they need to stay where they are. But a lot of people from Birmingham Equivocate. commute could to uh, Hoover to shop at right. that gallery of spot. Because it's the only real place the after real they closed everything. And Western Hill became... Trash. Uh, <laughs> but it was amazing because growing up in Fairfield... Fairfield was the premier city for African Americans mm -hmm. back in the day. Like I remember my mom asked her why we moved to Birmingham because we moved from Bush Boulevard, Bush Hills, mm -hmm. right over there in the upscale area near Legion Field to Fairfield. That's where I grew up, even though I was born at that home on Bush Boulevard. And Birmingham, well, Fairfield was the premier place. You had people, great people coming out of Birmingham, uh, Fairfield. You had people like Larry Langford, like. Larry Langford didn't care about nobody and what they had to say. Fairfield Industrial High School, like, you know, thinking historically that that school dealt with a lot of racial issues, even up until kind of close to the 80s. Fairfield was known for producing a lot of great athletes, a lot of judges, a lot of people who are huge in the education system. And to kind of go from being that premier city to kind of just falling by the wayside, that allows room for people to take their talents and their money to Hoover, mm. to the summit, and to Montgomery, to, you know, Tuscaloosa. Mm. So I think we have to do a better job as a community of, of getting these opportunities and appreciating them. And taking care of our and own. And taking care of our own. So you wouldn't have to have an issue as tragic as EJ's to happen. Because like you said, this happens every day. Every day. Cooper Green, you know, closing down that hospital. My mom was a nurse manager for the ER for years at Cooper Green. And now you're allowing other people to take over a somewhat black field populated hospital that a lot of people who experience those type of traumas you know were going to cooper green because they didn't have insurance now they have to go to uab and be a number remember probably not even getting checked in and not even getting checked yeah you got like you know it's it's historical that the people who come by way of ambulance have precedent over the people that sit in the lobby of course and you know who's to take who takes better care of you than your own people sometimes my first internship was a marketing communications internship with Kaiser Permanente in Atlanta, Georgia. Pause. What year? I did that the spring of 2016, so uh, going into my sophomore year. Going that time I'm going into my sophomore year. So explain. A lot of students don't understand you can get internships as a freshman going to your sophomore year. Right. It's pros and cons to it. I knew that on my own, I had experience, but I knew that I needed some type of gateway to get there so i applied to the inroads program which is basically like the program that tries to put minority students in corporate america jobs mm -hmm. so i got that as a freshman and it's the interesting story about it was initially i didn't get it but then like two days before they started i got a call asking for me to come to atlanta mm -hmm. so as a freshman i was living in atlanta being totally independent which was a great experience because it taught me, it prepared me for New York City, and essentially. That fall, so fall of 2016, the, the CEO of Enroads came to our end of the year presentation. And he was like super impressed with my work. So he asked me to serve as his intern. So I got to intern with Will Braun, which is an advertising sales uh, agency in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So like they managed like all of the branding for Enroads. So I got to work with an agency. That next summer I got to do, I started off as a public relations, media relations intern for Kaiser, again in Atlanta, Georgia. But I ended up going back to my in, my previous internship placement due to, you know, some unforeseen circumstances. And then this past summer I had the best internship that anyone could ever ask for. I got to intern with NBC Universal in New York City serving as an advertising sales internship. Intern, excuse me. So, internships are very much so important. Because of my internships, I think that I've built a lot of relationships with people. So, my ultimate goal is to be a music supervisor for scripted and unscripted shows and films. So, in a nutshell, all of those musics that you see within the different scenes of shows and movies, that's a music supervisor's role. So, I've come in contact with some amazing music supervisors 
on the West Coast is where NBC Universal does a lot of their productions for their shows. So NBC is broken up into four or five verticals. You have your news, you have your lifestyle shows, which is your E networks, um, which is your Bravo network, which is your Oxygen network, and it's one more I forgot. And then you have your entertainment shows, which is your USA, your Sci-Fi, your WWE. So NBC owns all of it, so on and so forth. They own all of those different properties. And so within that, you know, you gotta have music for your different shows. And so I got to speak with the music supervisor for all of NBC's uh, programming in Los Angeles. So I've kind of expressed a lot of interest to her. That's when I confirmed that music supervision was the role for me. But I wouldn't have even had the opportunity had I not started somewhere. So a lot of the times we wanna be Oprah, but we have a problem with it being, heck, I don't know, like someone who starts off at the bottom, Oprah Bring got- Bringing in coffee right. in the morning. Like, I think that that's what separates me from a lot of my peers is that I don't mind doing the small people stuff because the small people, Oprah started off as a small person mm -hmm. and you see where she is now. You know, you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I've done, even prior to collegiate internships, I was working with Deanna with shows and events that 95.7 Jam was having, you know, even my experience with the choir. So I started off small. I did a lot of free opportunities, but free opportunities mean great experiences. And if I didn't have those experiences, I wouldn't have even had these internships. So what did you do personally that built you or prepared you for those internships? Or did it... Were you was it uh, building blocks like the first one prepared you for the second one, second one for the third, third for the fourth? I w yeah, I would like to say it was a combination of both. I think you could have a lot of dreams and a lot of ambitions and a lot of opportunities, but if you don't have the drive within yourself to do it, you won't have them. So I think with me, I've never been afraid to ask questions. I've never been afraid to leverage my networks. Mm -hmm. And because Deanna was a person in the field that I knew that I wanted to go into, I was constantly like talking to her. Even until now, I've gotten a little better at, you know, kind of being more self-sufficient in my, my own, you know, dreams and convictions and stuff. So I don't have to rely on her as much. But when I first started in media, I called her for absolutely everything. But in that, God allowed me to meet a different person who put a different person in my path who was where I wanted to go. Another one of my great mentors is Jamise Price. And she currently is a reporter for WBRC Fox 6 in Birmingham. Okay. But she also was a former instru media instructor for an institution in Birmingham as well. So I'll just say that God allowed these women who just so happened to be African-American women who were so successful in their career field, he placed them in my life to help me get to where I, I, I needed to be. So I would say it's a combination of leveraging your network, you being a self-starter, because it starts within yourself. Once you make that first step, God does the rest. And of course, a combination of doing the little different opportunities that you know people bless me with mm -hmm. and to get in contact with those internship companies that got me where I am today.